1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, and it says, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. If I were to ask you guys the question this evening of how do you recognize the voice of the Lord? In a world that we live in today, it can often be difficult to recognize the voice of the Lord in our lives. It is oftentimes even recognized or to hear God calling us because we have so many things in our lives that distract us. We have so many things that get in the way with our communion with God. And so my question would be to you this evening, how do you recognize the voice of the Lord? See, back in 1 Samuel, as I give a little bit of a context of where we're at in chapter 3, there was a shortage or a famine of the word of God. We see here in verse 1, it says that the word of the Lord was rare. And it tells us that God's word at that time was scarce. And even in today's world, we see that there is a famine of God's word across the churches of the United States. We often see these weird things going on in church services, whether it's a guy taking off his shirt at a men's conference and climbing up a pole to same-sex marriages in the church. We have seen across the church that God's word has become famished in the church all across America. And even so, on a smaller sense, there can be a famine of God's word in our own lives. We often allow work. We often allow relationships. We often allow different things in our relationship with God to cause distance between us and God's word. And here in 1 Samuel chapter 3, we see the reason why there is a famine of God's word. When you look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 through 17, you will get a, 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 you, we will be introduced to a man named Eli. Eli was the high priest of Shiloh during this time. And Eli had two sons named Hophni and Phinehas. And they are recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. It is described here that they did not know the Lord. And they, be, they, they behaved with outrageous behavior against the Lord. These were men of God that had been appointed as priests of the Levitical tribe to govern and to lead the people of worship of the people of Israel. They were instructed by God's law to carry out the functions of worship in the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a big tent where the worship of, of God would take place and these high priests would go in once a year to provide offerings and sacrifices to the Lord on behalf of the people. But these men were corrupt. And it tells us that these have been the priests of God that have been appointed as mediators to receive revelation, to offer the sacrifices of the sins of the people, and to present the people before the Lord but it now become worthless men who are now leading this. And I don't think there is a more tragic thing in our lives when we see Christians who refer themselves as Christians live in a life of outward holiness, but living an inward life of being far from holy. These were priests of the Lord to carry out the functions and the worship of God. But instead, it tells us that they didn't know the Lord. When you look at 1 Samuel chapter 2 more closely, you will see that they were ripping off the offerings of the Lord. They were sleeping with the women of the tabernacle. They were changing the hearts that were intended to worship God. They were turning them away in such a way that it tells us in chapter 2 that the men despised the worship of the Lord. And there's no greater tragedy as we see people who call themselves Christians live a totally different life. See, as being children of God, we have been entrusted with his Holy Spirit. 
We've been entrusted to walk in holiness. We've been instructed to walk in love, to walk circumspectly. But a lot of times we have distanced ourselves from God's word and God's word becomes a famine in our lives. And what we now call ourselves Christian has nothing close to the holiness that God has called us to. And here in 1 Samuel chapter 2, we get a good description of what that looks like. God would not speak because of this to the priesthood. They were unholy. And when he did speak in chapter 2, he brought words of judgment. When you look at verses 30 to 36 of chapter 2, you will see in detail the judgment that God is going to bring against the house of Eli. Now the house of Eli was, he was the priest of Israel, the priest of Shiloh, and God is bringing judgment to them. He pronounces in, in this verses 30 to 36 that Eli and his family will be cut off and an enemy will be seen in your dwelling places. And the greatest sign of this tragic thing that will take place, it says that your sons will be killed. Eli's sons, corrupted, worthless men, will be dealt with by God. And we can always know that when we live a life that is not holy unto the Lord, Ultimately, God's judgment will come against us. We are told that this famine of God's word, but before we see that, we see in verse 1, it says, Now the boy Samuel ministered before the, before, to the Lord before Eli. Now up to this point, you guys, as we saw, we see that in chapter 2 there is detailed judgment that is coming against Eli and his two sons for being corrupt. But when you look in chapter 1, we see a family that is introduced to us in chapter 1. And a lot of you know who this lady is. One of the wives, this, this man marries a wife named Hannah. She, you guys know the story. She's barren. She's not able to hear, have children. So she, he marries another wife. I tried that with my wife, but it didn't work out too well. She gave me that look. <laughs> but in this struggle that she went through, the wife that was able to have children mocked her, teased her, brought her grief, brought her, her soul was in, in great grief. And she goes to the temple, to the tabernacle, and, and she makes a vow to the Lord saying, Lord, if you give me a son, I promise I will give him back to you. And she would go and pray. And the Bible tells us in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, that God grants her, grants her vow. She has a son named Samuel. She presents him to the Lord. And when you look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, you see a beautiful song and a beautiful prayer of Hannah, of God answering her prayer. You know, regardless of what we're going through, God hears our prayers. And verse 1 tells us that Samuel, it tells us that he's a boy. It probably referenced him to around 12 years old. But what's really interesting here at a young age, it says that he ministered to the Lord. I thought that was interesting. Because we think about how the Spirit ministers to us in our own lives. And I find it interesting that, that the, the writer here describes this young boy as ministering to the Lord. Well, how do we minister to the Lord when we're the ones that need to be ministered to? Right, oftentimes we're going through a lot of things. We're going through anxiety. We're going through depression. We're going through a lot of different things, whether it's at work or whether it's relational. A lot of times we go through these difficult things and we're asking, but how can we minister to the Lord? What do I have to offer the Lord? But when you look at the word here, ministered, it, it has an interesting meaning. And up to this point, we have seen, well, we will see here that there's five times that the Bible references here in 1 Samuel as Samuel ministering to the Lord. When you look at chapter 2, verse 11, 
It says, and the boy ministered to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. When you look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 18, Samuel was ministering before the Lord. When you look at chapter 2, verse 21, and the young, and the young man Samuel grew in the presence and ministered to the Lord. When you look at chapter 2, verse 26, it says he began to grow in stature and in favor, stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. And then when you see chapter 3, verse 1, it tells us that the young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. So we see at a young age that this boy is now ministering to the Lord. And it's interesting that even though we are seasoned in our Christianity, a lot of times we need that childlike faith to serve the Lord. And what I love here about this is that word ministered comes from a word, and, and earlier today uh, I spoke with uh, Courtney, a friend of mine. She, she was telling me that she was a food server before. So I was asking her questions. So really you're ministering to the people in a sense. Because the word ministering has the sense of being a servant or having that waiter's heart where you're serving the people, not the one to be served, but you become a personal servant. You go to a restaurant today and may I have water, they bring you a cup of water. Well, you're, my friend tries a little too salty, take them back. And they're there to serve us. And this is what the word in, encapsulate in the, in the Hebrew that it's a heart that is there to minister to the Lord, to serve the Lord in an intimate way. You know, this is ministry, right? Ministry is about being a servant. It's about having a waiter's heart. It's about serving people and serving Jesus and, and becoming a servant unto the Lord. That's what it means when Samuel ministered to the Lord. This is what the initial role of what a priest was to look like. It wasn't to look like the what you will see in chapter 2 of Eli and his two sons. When you look at Numbers chapter 16, verse 9, in reference to special service and worship, this is what it says. It is, a, is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to serve them. But it tells us here in verse, again in verse 1, that the word of God was rare in those days. You know, it seems like it's rare in these days as well. Because of the hardness of heart among the people and the corruption of the priest, God's word was rare. When you look at the word rare, it has a meaning of being scarce or precious. And I want to ask you, how do you handle God's word? Do you handle it in a way that it's scarce and, and precious to you? If I were to take all you guys to my office right now, I have like six Bibles in my shelf, all the same version. I don't know why. My wife made me buy them. I don't, I don't know why. When you go to my house and, and, and upstairs, what I call my office, it's not really an office, I have like eight Bibles there. Yeah, I may have a lot of Bibles, but are they precious to me? Is God's word precious to you? Do we hold it with that sense that it's scarce and, and precious to us? Or is this just something that takes up shelf space? Is it something that you just take very casually? Because if so, that may be a good indicator that God's word is a famine in your own life. How you respond to God's word. How you handle God's word. And here, it tells us that the word of God was rare. I once seen this video, you guys. It was interesting. It was a, a video that it was in a, somewhere in underground China. And there was a bunch of people that were waiting around for a delivery, and they were all huddled there under in this, in like this basement, and, and these boxes come in, and, and you see God, you see these people open up boxes, and, and the Chinese, and they're opening up, and they're literally taking Bibles out of this box, they're wrapped in cellophane, 
And when they get to God's word, they hold it close to their hearts. They, they're holding it like it's a rare, precious gem. And they're weeping over God's word. And they're holding it like they're holding it like this, that it meant so much to them. And here I do is I have eight Bibles sitting there and, and none of them have really ever been opened. How do we handle God's word? Is it precious to you? Is it one of those things that it's so rare that you value it so much that you're in it every day? Because if we're not, there is a famine of God's word in our lives. This is how God speaks to us. He guides us through his word. When, people, when his people seek him, and when his people seek him to serve, we will find him. It tells us that the effective, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous avails much. See, when we seek God's word, and we make it such a thing in our lives that it's precious to us, this is where God will speak to us. But see, oftentimes we, we've created distance between the presence of God and God's word in our lives. We've allowed circumstances to get in the way. We've allowed relationships. We've allowed jobs. We've allowed so many things to get into the way of our lives where oftentimes we can see God's word as just something we read when we're in trouble. I was sharing with the men that when I was in jail, and I know it's hard for you guys to believe that, but what I would do is when you're in those bunks in county jail, it's like you're in a coffin. They stack you like three deep. And what I would do is I would get the, the Gideon's Bible, the paperback ones, and I would put it right underneath the bunk of the person on the top, and I would pray to the Bible, thinking that praying to God's word would get me where I want to get out. I, I want to get out of jail. But see, I was never opening the Bible. I was praying to it as a gimmick. I was using it for a way to get my way. See, even though the Bible was there, I was not using it. And there was a famine in my life. When you look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It tells us in verse 1, there was no widespread revelation. It, it literally means that nothing was sent abroad by prophets or by God's word. There was a true famine of God's word. When Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. And when we look at verse 2, it tells us that it came to pass that it, at the time when while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begin, begun to grow so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the Ark of the Covenant was, and while Samuel was lying down. There is some cool stuff in this. Because when we look at this closer, we will see a contrast to proximity of God's presence. The first thing it tells us here, that Eli was very old. It tells us that he was laying in his place and his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see. Age was catching up to him. His failing eyesight was, no doubt, a part of his unwelcome physical deterioration that accompanies old age. I mean, that's me today. I get out of bed and I feel this and I feel that. You know, we went to Knott's Berry Farm with the kids, and I got on this ride, which is probably the most dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> and I literally got off that ride, and I was cross-eyed. <laughs> I was like, and I was like, I'm getting old. The next day, it felt like I was in a car accident. <laughs> That's how old I'm getting. And I try to scream, and nothing comes out, you know. And, and, and so we know that as we get older, you know, we, we begin to lose eyesight. We begin to lose hearing. We, 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 get, we get older. But yet, what's interesting here is that the writer here is choosing to highlight Eli's particular aspect of declining. Interesting how the writer points that out. He's pointing that out. 
that his decline, and he mentions this after it's mentioned that there's no widespread revelation. Is that interesting? It was the priest of God that were to give people the message of God. It was the priest of God that would offer sacrifices. And it's interesting how the writer sets this up because he tells us that his eyes were growing dim, that he was deteriorating, but only after when he mentions that there is no widespread revelation of God's word. See, when there is no revelation in our lives of God's word, and I'm not talking about some weird, crazy new revelation, God's word is revelation in itself. And when there is no revelation of God in our lives, spiritually, we will begin, our eyes will begin to grow dim. We will start seeing and compromising weird things. We will start allowing things in our lives that typically we would not allow if we were in God's word. And this is what the writer's pointing out here. But what's even interesting here, that even though Eli's physical condition was really a reflection of his spiritual reality, it says that he could not see, and of course he would not see God's word because his darkness was deep. He didn't even want to rebuke his own sons when they were sleeping with the women at the tabernacle, when they were ripping off God. He would not rebuke them. Instead, he was valuing his sons more than God's word. And what's interesting here, and I want to point this out, notice where, where Eli was laying. If you look here in verse 2, it says that Eli was laying down in his own place. It doesn't mention where this place at, and of course, there's nothing wrong with that. We all have our place where we lay to go to sleep, and after all, as we will see, it was nighttime. But in his own place is interesting. We will make here in a few moments a, a very stark contrast before where Eli is lying and where Samuel, the boy, is lying. And there's application that I want to point out with that. But it tells us, before I get to that, but it tells us here in verse 2 that, again, his eyes begin to grow so dim that he could not see. And we know that this is true physically, but because there was no widespread revelation, there's no indication that there's any communication with the Lord. Of course, he's spiritually going to, his eyes are going to grow dim spiritually. And this is the result of not being in God's word. I think we can do a good job in having this attitude when it comes to God's word. We oftentimes will use this method because we're busy, because we have a lot going on. And a lot of times we will go, okay, Lord, therefore, indeed, I send prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them will kill you and crucify you. Jesus, be with me. Thank you for this day. God bless you. No wonder there is no widespread revelation in our lives. Because our life in God's word is in a famine. And it's only when we spend time in God's word, we spend time in prayer, that the Holy Spirit through us gives us what we need to pursue God's word. But oftentimes we allow so many different things. And what's so interesting here, again, as the writer is, seems to be selecting physical details of Eli, but there's a striking significance about this. We see in verse 3 also that it says that, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was laying down. Do you, do you catch that? First, I want to talk about in the lamp, before the lamp of God went out. You know, what's interesting, when you look in the book of Exodus, it tells us that the, the lamp of God, it was a fire that was in the tabernacle, was to be continuously burning from, uh, from, uh, I have it, from evening to morning. When you look at Exodus chapter 27, verses 20 to 21, it tells us, and you should command the children of Israel that you bring pure oil pressed, of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. In the tabernacle of meeting outside the veil, 
which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall tend to it from evening until morning before the Lord. And it shall be a statue forever to the generations on behalf of the children of Israel. See, so God instructed them, the priests, in the book of Exodus, that this lamp was to continue to burn. This lamp of God, the fire of God, was to continually to burn from evening to morning continuously. What's interesting here is what Eli didn't know, that yes, eventually the lamp of God will go out. And what I mean by the lamp of God going out because the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the holdings of holdings, and the lamp of God represented a perpetual presence of God's presence. And when the lamp of God would go out, it would allow the priest to prepare the next day, getting all the oil, olive oil, and getting it together to prepare for the lamp of God to burn again that evening. And in the morning time, they would prepare the, the, the altar where it was at to prepare it again. But we notice that since there, that Eli's vision spiritually is growing so dim that he's neglecting that work of the Lord. And this is what happens when we neglect God's word. But I want us to note, interesting to point out, that when you look in chapter 4, you will eventually see the presence of God removed from the nation of Israel. What's interesting in contrast in proximity. Now, I want to talk about the proximity where Eli was laying. It says that he was laying in his own place. In contrast, it tells us that Samuel was laying near the ark of God. It tells us in verse 3 that, that when uh and the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was laying down. You know, it's interesting that this youth, this boy, positions himself not only spatially, but spiritually. He was the only one of all Israel closest to the Lord when it talks about the Ark of God or the Ark of the Covenant, this was a representation of God's throne in Israel. If you look in Exodus chapter 25 and you can get a description of the Ark of God from verses 10 to 22. But it was the most important piece of furniture that was in the tabernacle. It, it was where the holies of holies was at. It was in a place that was only for its own place and the presence of God would dwell there. It, had, it tells us that the ark had the two tables of the, the two tablets of the law. It was the golden mercy seat where God's glorious presence dwelt. It was kept in the most holy place of this tabernacle. The people never seen it. Only the high priest entered and saw the ark only once a year. When you look at Numbers chapter 7, verse 89, it says that when Moses went into the tabernacle of the meeting to speak with him, he heard the voice of one speaking from above the mercy seat that was the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubs, cherubim, thus he spoke to him. So we see that this ark of God was a very significant representation of God's throne. And it was so holy that it had its own place that only the priest of God can enter once a year. But again, we read about Samuel's position in, in verse 3. That where this ark was at, in the tabernacle, that's where Samuel was lying. When it tells us in verse 4, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. And he said, I didn't call you, lie down again. And he went and lay down. Then the Lord called yet again Samuel. So Samuel arose and, and, and went to Eli, and Eli said, and he said, Here I am, for you called me. And he answered, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor the, was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. So he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, 
for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. What was so rare that we read about in those days happened that night. God's word was rare. There was a famine of God's word. But that night, the word came to Samuel. It tells us that the word, the Lord called Samuel. Now the word called, that's an interesting word. It means to appoint. He literally, according to the Hebrew, shouted his name. And he appointed him. But you know what's interesting about where Samuel was laying? And I want us to get this. Only when we are in close proximity to the Spirit of the Lord can we hear his call. It's only when we are close to God is when we're able to recognize his voice and hear his call in our lives. If we have distanced ourselves or we're lying down in our own place as it was described to Eli, shouldn't it have been Eli that was laying next to the ark? He's the priest. And not once did he hear from God's word. But yet this boy who positioned himself to be around the presence of God heard God's voice, heard his call. And we can never expect to be called by the Lord or never expect to hear God's voice unless we're in close proximity to his presence. The Bible tells us that uh, God tells us, you draw near to me and I will draw near to you. So what has gotten in your way to have close proximity with Jesus? Are we in close proximity to hear his voice? Are we close enough to his presence that we would hear him call us to appoint us, to set us apart, to use us? What's interesting is that we see here in verse 4, he answers, here I am, Lord. He didn't even know who he was responding to. This is a beautiful way to respond to God's word. It isn't that God doesn't know where we're at, but it tells, but it tells God and remind us that we're simply servants before him, asking him, what do you want me to do? Oftentimes we can use God as a genie, right? Get me out of this jam and I promise I'll serve you. Instead of saying, Lord, what is it you want me to do? You know, Samuel is among others who've also said, here I am, when the Lord has spoke to him. Abraham has said it in Genesis chapter 22. Jacob had the same response in Genesis 46. Moses had the same response in Exodus chapter 3. And Isaiah had the same response in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. But it's only when we're in the presence of the Lord is when we're able to hear from the Lord. So how do we recognize the voice of the Lord, especially with so many distractions? First and foremost, we need to spend time in God's word. Yes, God will speak to us in an audio voice, and, and maybe some of you have heard God speak to you in an audio voice. Sometimes I think the Lord's speaking to me in an audio voice, but it's really my wife saying, wake up. <laughs> yes, Lord, here I am. But for most of us, we will hear God's voice through his word. But it's also easier for distractions to take us away from God's word if we're not in God's word. You know, it's interesting when... when I sit down to spend time in God's word, the dog starts barking. Or the, I'm getting text. It's just all these distractions. And it's so easy to just to pick up your phone and start scrolling and looking through things. And the next thing you know, there's 45 minutes to an hour has gone by and you haven't even read God's word yet. I'm guilty of doing that. And we can allow so many distractions to take us away from being in God's word. But it tells us here in verse 4 that the Lord called Samuel. He spoke to Samuel. We see that in verses 4, verse 6, 
verse 8 and verse 10. And these first three times, what's interesting is that Eli, uh, Samuel thinks it's Eli calling him because he runs to him. But you know, one of, the, the, one of the marks of a faithful servant of God is an attentive ear and an immediate response. When we look at verses five through six, you see that he runs in haste. He hears God's voice calling out to him, and he responds, here I am. He didn't call Dr. Phil. He didn't go to the view or Oprah Winfrey. He went to the priest and said, here I am. You know, that decisive, immediate response is obedience to God's word. And oftentimes, God will speak to us, but we want to form a committee first to see if it's really the Lord speaking to us. Or we want to check the latest polls to see if it's popular to hear from God's word. Or we want to look on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok to see what they have to say about it. No, we're to respond in an immediate response to God's word. As I mentioned that, he didn't know who was calling him. Who else would have been calling him? But you do notice his energetic responsiveness, and he, it was immediate and fast, and he runs to Eli. And it was interesting that Eli was discerning enough to say, you know what, no, no, it's the Lord speaking to you. He told him how to respond. So he sends him back to bed, and, and he tells him, I didn't call you. And this is repeated in verse 6. Neither Samuel or Eli truly understood what was happening at that time, but the writer has told us twice now that it was the Lord that was calling Samuel. And now the writer gives us an explanation for Samuel's response to this extraordinary voice. When you look at verse 7, it tells us that Samuel did not know the Lord. This is interesting. This is a peculiar thing to say? Because haven't we just seen that it was Samuel that was ministering to the Lord? But now the writer's pointing out to us that he didn't know the Lord yet. What does it mean when it tells us that he did not know the Lord? What's interesting about this here, it, it mimics and it sounds very similar to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, when describing the corrupt sons, Eli and Phinehas, I mean, in Hophni and Phinehas. Because when you look at their verse, it tells us clearly that they did not know the Lord. So what's the difference? <clears throat> well, in their case, they were described as worthless men. But here, the description of Samuel, even though it repeats the words of chapter 2, verse 12, there's a significant difference in this. It tells us that Samuel did not yet know the Lord. They didn't, the, the two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, didn't know the Lord because they rejected the knowledge of the Lord. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because in verse 7 it tells us that it had yet been re, not yet been revealed to him. You know, having an intimate and personal relationship with Jesus there's a difference of knowing about God or knowing God. But what's the difference? Yeah, I know about God. I heard him deliver the children of Israel in the book of Exodus. Yeah, I know about God. He, he put people in the ark or he instructed people to go in the ark because there was a flood. Yeah, I know about him. Yeah, I heard somewhere that, you know, God came in the flesh and called him Jesus and, you know, he died on a cross, really not sure why. See, that's knowing about God. But do we truly know him? See, that word know him and to know him in the, in the original language is yada. Yabba dabba do. No, it's yada. And yada is the same Hebrew word when it describes the intimacy between Adam and Eve. But yet, even though it's not that same context, it's still the same meaning of having an intimate personal relationship with God. And this only comes through God's word. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24 says, but let him who glorifies glory, glories glory in this, 
that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. God is telling us that he delights in those who are in his word. Eli realized that something was happening and that it had not happened to Shiloh for a very long time, that God's word is coming. But his sight has grown so dim, but yet he was not completely blind. And we see in verses 8 and 9 that the Lord calls to Samuel again a third time. So he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy, and Eli instructed him and said, Go lie down, and it shall be that if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lied down in his place. When speaking to us, God will always confirm his word again and again. The call that we get is from God and not from us. God is the one that calls us, and our responsibility when God calls us, is to respond in obedience. When we look at verse 10, it says, Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, and Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered and says, Speak, for your servant hears. Samuel obeyed Eli and went back to his sleeping place and waited for the voice to come again. But what's interesting this time, notice how he calls Samuel. He calls him twice. Samuel, Samuel. He called his name twice. For the shepherd calls his sheep by name and gets their attention. John chapter 10, verses 3 and verse 14 says, To him the doorkeeper opens, but the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his sheep by name, And leads them out. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. But what I want to point out here, and we're going to wrap this up, is verse verse 10. This again is in response to Samuel's close proximity to the ark of God. His close proximity to the presence of the Lord. Because we see here, remember with me, There is a famine going on in the nation of Israel. And the only word that is coming, that is of the Lord, is coming to Samuel. But I want to to point out something here. When we respond in obedience to God's word, when we're in close proximity to God's presence, I want to point out what it says here in verse 10. Now the Lord came and stood and called. That's interesting. We're not quite sure how the Lord manifested himself to Samuel. But this tells us here that it may have been an appearance that's called a theophany or a Christophany. It's when the presence of God or the presence of Jesus comes incarnate in the flesh. And here we see the Lord. Now you notice the Lord is all capitalized. It's talking about Jehovah God. He manifested himself in such a way to Samuel because Samuel was in close proximity to his presence. Samuel responded to him in quick obedience. And now we see the result of our obedience in God Staying in close proximity to his presence, we see that God responds. The Lord came, and he stood, and he called. I I find this really interesting. Because again, only when we're we're close to the Lord, that we have that personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. That he comes to us, and he approaches us. The Bible tells us in John 15, 16, he makes it clear that We didn't choose him, he chose us. And he's the one that has come to Samuel. You know, it's interesting that when we are in God's will, he comes to us. And what is interesting when he tells us that he stood, his presence was before Samuel. Imagine being in the presence of the Lord. But you know, when we're walking in his holiness, 
when the Spirit of God is indwelling us, when we're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, His presence is with us. When we're in God's Word, when we're in prayer, when we're seeking a life of living a life set apart for the Lord, His presence is with us. And it tells us that once He comes to Him, and once His presence is surrounded Him, then it says here that God, that He is called. He's appointed for good works. See, God is wanting us, is wanting to have this amazing relationship with him. This is why Jesus came to die on the cross for our sin, that we may have fellowship with him, that his presence would dwell within us, that his Holy Spirit would fill us, fill our lives. And when we are in obedience to his word, he will come to us. He will stand with us. He will get us through the difficult times. The Bible tells us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He stands when we walk in the valley of the shadow of death. He is with us when we're going through times of brokenness. He is with us when he is, we're going through times of joy. He will stand with us. And this is only in response to our obedience to God's word. But we've allowed so many things to distance, to distract, to get in the way of being close to Jesus. Because there is no greater thing than the Lord wants to do than to come to us, that he may walk with us, that he fills us with his presence, and then he calls us to do a good work. What have we allowed to get into our way? What have we allowed to distance ourselves from the proximity of God's Holy Spirit? What have we allowed to get in the way to distract us from his presence? See, when God's word saturates our lives, when he saturates our hearts, our words will follow, our life will follow. And in this case, this is where God went to Samuel and Samuel's word was there also. This is an amazing example of obedience to God's word. This is also a tragic example of creating distance between God and ourselves. One is described as the priest of God, whose eyes begin to grow dim, who's distanced himself from the presence of the Lord. And because of result of that, there was a widespread famine and no revelation came. But on the other hand, we see young Samuel who's close in proximity to the ark of God. He responds to his voice in obedience, and Lord is speaking to him. Do you see the difference? See, one has distanced himself from the Lord. The other has drawn close to the Lord. Where are you? Because there's no middle ground. You either have distance and have allowed circumstances of life to distance our or walk with the Lord, or has distanced you from the presence of God, or we are before the ark of God. We are in his presence, seeking him his word, seeking and responding in obedience. Where are you? There's no middle ground. We are either growing close, or we're growing distant. And we have two examples here, of one being close, and one being distant. This is an amazing example example on Samuel's part of obedience to God's word. Where are you tonight? See, my hope is that we draw close to the Lord, especially in these days where we are going through so many different things, we, we cannot do it alone. We need the presence of God. We need the power of God through his word. And oftentimes we sell ourselves short because we create a distance between us and the Lord when we should be running to the Lord and staying in close proximity. My prayer is that tonight that we're filled with God's Spirit, that we draw close to Him, that we have a rekindling for His Word, that we draw even close to Him and respond in decisive and quick obedience. Because, friends, our time is running short. We are in these last days. And we don't have time to distance ourselves from the Lord. What we need to do is draw closer to him.